Well, now, thank you to uh, Farm Credit and to Sagenta for your general support for this summit. And uh, I'm excited. My name is Philip Brasher. Um, and uh, excited to introduce this uh, next panel on biomanufacturing. And uh, the title for our discussion is Biomanufacturing was supposed to be a boom for rural America. Where is it working and why? And we're also going to get into what, uh, uh, what the future looks like uh, uh, for biomanufacturing. And thank you for this, uh, the members of our panel who've, who've uh, joined us today. Uh, from uh, to my left, from your left to, as you look at the stage, from left to right, uh, we have Naku Hernandez, uh, Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder at Soyle Innovations, James Glick, Executive Director of the Plant-Based Products Council, Tom Dower, Vice President of Public Policy for Lanza Tech, Beth Connerty, Associate Director for the business, for business Development of the Integrated Bioprocessing Research Laboratory in Illinois. And um, finally, Betsy Dirksen Lundergan joins us as Administrator of USDA's Rural Business Cooperative Service. The view from Betsy to give us the view from USDA. I want to start out with just to give us an idea where we are in this in biomanufacturing at this point of time in 2024. And I've asked James uh, with Plant Plant Based Products Council to kind of give us a 50,000 foot or 30,000 foot overview as you, of uh, what the landscape looks like. Yeah, absolutely, Phil. In the Plant Based Products Council, I mean, we represent all of those companies, um, both large and small, who are committed to advocating for a shift towards a more sustainable bioeconomy. And what that bioeconomy really means is it's the people in the businesses who produce, sell, and purchase plant-based products. And that range of products is pretty exciting. I mean, we're talking about everything from auto parts to office supplies, from construction and building materials to electronics. Uh, many of the products that we rely on every day can be made from plants. So it's a testament to that American innovation. You know, everything from the greases and lubricants that we use on the farm to uh, the playground equipment and the athletic surfaces that we find in our schools, the packaging that we all see in offices and businesses you know, can be made from plants. You know, the clothes we wear, the containers that we, and the, and the utensils we use for our food, uh, the, the chemicals and the products that clean our homes and that clean our offices, and even baby diapers can be made from plants. So essentially we're talking about the alternatives to products produced from traditional fossil fuel based materials. And the feedstocks, uh, the, the, the sort of the sources of those materials are just as diverse as the products. So we're talking about everything made from nature, renewable biomass crops and inorganic waste material. Um, so thinking about corn and soy, you know, most commonly in the US, but we're also looking at hemp and rice, sugar, algae, bamboo and wood are also used as part of those feedstocks. Um, and, and maybe touching on some of that consumer demand, if, that, if that's helpful as well, Phil, but but uh, the Plant-Based Products Council has done research over the last several years um, about that question of what are consumers thinking about these products. And, and over two-thirds of them report purchasing plant-based products in the past month. And in the, the numbers we had from this past December, about 80% of consumers actually say that they consider bio-based materials when they're making those, those purchasing decisions. Um, maybe just as interesting and maybe more so is that two-thirds of those folks who identify as Republicans and Democrats both say they support federal policies that support bio-based products. Um, and then the other thing I think that's important in this crowd and as we think about the value chain, which, which our membership represents, is, is over two-thirds also say that, that they identify kind of the ag industry and, and farmers as they think about the bio-based industry. And so, I mean, we're talking about industry that, that USDA's most recent numbers uh, you know, hit on you know, $489 billion a year um, in sort of economic benefit, about 4 million jobs. And we're talking about pretty high paid jobs in, in rural communities. So it's a, it's a pretty diverse industry. It's, it's, it's growing. Um, and I think we'll hear about that from others on the panel. Okay. And uh, we want to hear your questions. So get those into Slido and uh, we'll uh, bring you into the conversation. I've asked uh, next uh, Neku and uh, Tom to talk about their particular companies and what they do. Um, give us a, a little snapshot of where you are. Yep. 
Uh, Nakur Nandes, Soile Innovation. Soile Innovation was uh, funded in 2020 to answer the call from the industry for uh, making new products out of uh, renewable materials, and speci specifically for the construction market. So around 2012, there was a shortage of materials added to the asphalt industry to, to make the roads, uh, in particular in Iowa. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, asphalt industry has been seeing a decrease in the quality of the material thanks to the refineries getting all the higher value products out of, them, uh, of those, uh, you know, petroleum. So what we got have left is a uh, asphalt that lacks physical qualities to get a good road. So we need to add new products to the additives to the to this asphalt to get those uh, properties back. So that's what we're doing. We develop a family of uh, soybean oil-based products to add to these asphalt uh, materials to improve the physical properties of the asphalt so we can get uh, roads that last longer and at the same time increase the uh, decrease the carbon uh, emissions when we're producing it because we can increase the recycled materials in these asphalt pavements and and the energy consumption. Okay. Tom, Lanza Tech. Thanks, Philip. Uh, thanks for having us at this, uh, this conference. Thanks to Sarah. Um, so Lanza Tech is a carbon recycling uh, company. Uh, and actually, just a quick note of personal introduction. Um, I'm from rural Pennsylvania, grew up uh, next to a dairy farm, so watched, uh, you know, watched my, my farmer neighbors uh, do the work, and also lived in a Procter & Gamble town, so um, yeah, I guess it's faded that I've ended up in uh, sort of biotechnology at, a, at an industrial scale. Um, Lanza Tech is actually headquartered in the Midwest. We're in Skokie, Illinois, so just north of Chicago. Uh, but the company started in 2005 in New Zealand and has insourced over time into the United States, uh, where, which is truly the home of innovation and, and biotechnology. Um, so we've, we have uh, a platform that's based on bacteria and we do gas fermentation. So you know, you're all very familiar. Uh, some, some even run beer companies that are extremely familiar with fermentation. Um, but we do gas fermentation. So we take carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen in its, its various forms. We can capture industrial gases. We could also gasify um, municipal solid waste, agricultural wastes, forestry residues and wastes, and, uh, and really try to get at, at the heart of replacing fossil fuels with, with truly sustainable products, uh, chemicals, um, the, the many things in our daily lives that all today come from fossil fuels, there really is an above ground answer to all of that. So we're highly focused on, on converting wastes essentially uh, into that, which will be a good segue into the, the panel after the, after the break, which is specifically on that topic. Yeah, Thanks. Great. Thanks, Tom. Beth, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, tell us about uh, your work in, in uh, central Illinois and Sure. Trying to develop the technology, the infrastructure. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, so I help run the Integrated Bioprocessing Research Lab, or IBRL, at the University of Illinois. And we are a pilot scale facility that helps bioprocessing technologies get from kind of the bench scale, when you think of a science lab, working with pi pipettes and glassware, um, de-risked up through higher levels of technology readiness and commercial readiness. Um, so. Maybe the, the two panelists on stage might have needed us a few years ago. I think they're a little past us now. Um, but we're, we're talking about biomanufacturing, and, and James talked about you know, all these different products. And at, at its heart, manufacturing is a very expensive process. Uh, and startup companies, um, the previous panel was talking about how, how difficult capital can be right now. And so maybe it's not the wisest use of startup capital to each of those companies be purchasing millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment. Um, so that's where we come in. Uh, we, we are a, a facility that helps those companies. Uh, we've got a, a staff to help scale bioprocessing technologies up. Um, this has also led to IBRL being the lead for our EDA designated tech hub in central Illinois, uh, where we are trying to address fermentation and bioprocessing, biomanufacturing infrastructure at a variety of scales um, because, because it's a huge bottleneck to the industry. And again, like I said, it's, it's just very, very expensive. So we can, if we can approach this more strategically and be a, more of a support organization, uh, we, we hope that we can help more startup companies and more technologies uh, get to the point where Soyle and Lanza Tech are. 
Thank you, Beth. And Betsy, uh, the view from USDA in terms of where are you all uh, in terms of trying to incubate and get uh, help these new businesses get going. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I love talking about this. Um, I did want to say, Darren Riggs, are you still here? I really feel like the Londrigan family. Uh, I'm from Springfield, Illinois. I really feel like we're doing our part for the brewery. Um, <laughs> oh, there you are. Yeah, just saying. Big fans. Big fans. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the administrator for rural business and cooperative services. And so we provide grants and loans to rural businesses. Uh, we do that directly. We do it through banks. Um, we also do it through cooperatives. And so when I hear people talking about being in rural America and needing that funding, I am sitting in the audience thinking, do you know about rural development? Uh, you need to talk to us because we have so many different programs to support this effort. And it's exciting, too, because the Biden-Harris administration has made historic investments in rural America. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the executive order infused $40 billion into agriculture, forestry, and rural development, $14 billion of that into biofuels and renewable energies. And so this is a great time, and as we are looking at the future and people talk about needing biomass and uh, the biomass report that came out, one of the questions that was asked is, do we have enough biomass to support the industries of the future? Um, and the answer is yes. And those opportunities are all over rural America. Uh, we have feedstock in rural America. Our job at Rural Business and Cooperative Service is to provide those programs to the folks who want to use um, every piece of what they're raising uh, to contribute to the economy in the future. And our programs can be layered. They can be partnered so that you can use multiple programs which are going to bring down costs and diversify and generate revenue. So this is exciting. Okay. Thank you. And we'll come back to you, Betsy, to talk about, uh, get your view on, on some of these policy issues, some of the challenges that uh, uh, the sector has faced and continues to face. I want to dig in, uh, because this is a co policy conference, we want to put a big focus on uh, federal as well as state and local policies and where they're helping, where there may be barriers. Um, and of course, also there are capital issues as well. Um, James, because what are this? What are the issues here? Is we are um, raised by the title of this is uh, we've been talking about biomanufacturing for at least a couple of a uh, couple of decades that, that I recall, and various probably even it's been a dream going way uh, way earlier than that. Um, where do, you, where do you see the industry at this point? What do you see the, the, the major barriers, the major drivers? How has it changed? You've had a seat both uh, in Congress, uh, looking at it from, from that perspective as a uh, senior staff, and now in industry as well. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think, Phil, you're right. It's been about more than 20 years that we've been talking about some of these issues, at least from a policy perspective, uh, thinking about the bio-preferred program um, in sort of Betsy's wheelhouse. I mean, that started back in the 2002 Farm Bill, I believe. So we've got several Farm Bill iterations as well uh, of some of these energy programs and, and policy targets. But, but thinking about it and kind of you know, looking at the other folks on the panel, this is innovation. I mean, it's not something that it happens overnight. Um, some of these products, you know, it might take several years in a laboratory. It might take some of that, that pre-commercial scale up that Beth was talking about before it gets to the marketplace. And so now, I mean, looking just at the bio-preferred um, sort of catalog in kind of federal government on the procurement side is, is sort of an example. The, the thousands of products that are there today, um, it's taken 20 years to, to get there to that range of innovation. And so thinking about, you know, from a policy perspective, where are some of those challenges? Um, a, a big part of it, and, and Beth talked about it, is, is sort of getting from that laboratory to that scale-up. Um, you're looking around the world, there's a lot of interest in the bioeconomy, not just here in the U.S. and in, 
and sort of in our communities, but, but in places like Asia and China particularly, um, in Europe as well. And, and some of those countries have spent a lot of time and resource, you know, back to the early 2000s as well, uh, making this an investment priority. And so while we've got a lot of bright ideas in the U.S., the, the challenge now is making sure we can, can keep those kind of bright minds and, and talent as we, as we scale up. And so I think that's one of the challenges is how do we maintain that, that uh, kind of infrastructure and, and sort of investment in infrastructure that we need to, to scale up in the U.S. Um, the other challenge, of course, is on the workforce side. Um, and, you know, talking about some of the jobs that this industry can, can create and has created. Um, it's, you know, engineers, it's, it's folks in the, in the chemistry and in biology areas, as well as those that have manufacturing expertise. And so that workforce challenge is another one. Um, and, and then maybe the third one is, is sort of, um, you know, I think Beth talked about de-risking on, on sort of the, the um, kind of on the manufacturing side, but also thinking about growers. I mean, there's a lot of biomass available, but, but as growers think about their market and, and new opportunities, uh, making sure that they've got the tools and the risk management that they need to, to, to engage in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably come back to that risk management issue. Tom and Naku, uh, from, from your perspectives, uh, Naku, you're mostly working with soybean oil. Um, Tom, you're working with um, more on the waste side, waste products. What are your what are your challenges? Biggest challenges from start with a regulatory perspective, or if you have is it regulatory? Is it capital? What are your Tom? Start with you. Sure, um, happy to do that. Um, so our challenges really depend on which geography we're in. So we're in the U.S., so I'll obviously talk about about U.S. Um, the first challenge is what we are trying to do is hard, and we are trying to displace industries that have been in place for 100, 150 years, have spent billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of private and public capital to, uh, to really do what they do now, which is very efficient, very well done. We're trying to replace that, absent a price on carbon. And carbon is what drives what we're doing. We are trying to reduce emissions and create truly a, a circular, sustainable economy. Uh, using waste resources that are above ground to replace what we today pull from underground. Um, that's a very difficult thing. So then we have to look at, well, what kind of policy incentives can be put in place to help? Um, and obviously the federal government has a number of policies. Uh, the tax credits that some have been pre-existing, like 45Q for carbon capture and utilization and storage, um, the new hydrogen credits, 45V, the uh, sustainable aviation fuel, fuel credits and other uh, energy credits that are transitioning into to 45Z. So we have a number of, of those pr um, programs as well as, of course, the robust support from the Department of Energy on RDD and D along the entire supply chain from early research and innovation through and over the valley of death, hopefully, to get to early commercialization, first of a kind plants, and really deploying. So though there are a lot of challenges to overcome. Um, there are a number of programs that are, are meant to help that, but what we need is certainty around those. Uh, and, and the flexibility to have technology neutral performance based standards that really do that, that really truly are technology neutral so those innovations can come to market and meet the need of the day. You're talking about, just follow up there, Tom, you're talking about certainty. The, you, you referred to the tax credits, a uh, number of tax credits, all part of the Inflation Reduction Act. They're all sunset. Does that create a, a challenge in terms of uh, investment? and? In Yes, oh, um, not all tax credits are created equal, and um, the credits that have from the IRA, for example, uh, either a new life or an extended life for 10 years, uh, but then they, from the, the point of production or the point of, of uh, you know, coming online, you can have that credit for a number of years, for example, another 10 years uh, or 12 years in the case of 45Q. Those are very helpful because it gives you a big runway to take off, and then it gives you a runway of, of time to collect the credit. Um, the, unfortunately, the sustainable aviation fuel credits were only created for five years, and they were you know, truncated between two different credits, so there's a lot of, of uncertainty there. Um, and we're still waiting for the, the methodology around life cycle analysis, which is you know, upon which the value of the credit is based on carbon intensity. So we really need to nail down what that carbon intensity process is. Um, but a five-year credit, while uh, and having spent um, a long time in Washington, creating a new tax credit is no small feat. So very uh, thankful for Congress and the President for, for providing that, but then giving longer-term certainty, we absolutely need uh, to have those, those types of credits extended at the earliest possible opportunity because we're trying to, and our, our spin-off company, Lanzajet, and you'll hear from Alex later on a, a panel about sustainable aviation fuel, trying to build you know, projects in the hundreds of millions of dollars and ultimately billions of dollars range, uh, you, need, you need the financing. And if you can't get sustainable aviation fuel down to, the, to be competitive with jet fuel, 
that's a difficult business to, to be in in the United States. Niku, you play in a very different space in terms of what, were, what, are, you, what are your challenges to keep you from really um, growing like you'd like to? Yeah. So the twofold. Uh, first, regulation. Each state will have, the Department of Transportation will have a different set of performance that is going to be different from the from the next state. So just having uh, having to do all the testing per per state, it is a uh, uh, very expensive and a very timely uh, challenge for us. Um, but but I, I think the main one for us is just the perception that bio-based products are not. Uh, on par or so par performance as the petroleum based materials as Tom mentioned we're competing with mar uh, with industry that has already been uh, uh, established for more than you know 50 60 years and have billions of dollars in investments so when you're trying to uh, introduce these new bio-based materials, they're always not seen as, as the same performance that they can get with these petroleum materials. So um, the construction industry, uh, it is one of the most risk averse uh, industries there is because they are not incentivized to be risky. They, they are not paid more for using bio-based materials. They just have to meet specific qualities. So at the end of the day, it's just what price is what makes the decision speaking of uh, being uh, speaking of being r risk averse Betsy we have a, have a question here but I also want to ask you about the bio preferred program because one of the big big potential markets is the federal government and USDA has been working for some years in terms of trying to get um, other agencies to to use a number of these products what what is the challenge there uh, what are the prospects well, I mean, we, so for those of you that aren't familiar, the Bio Preferred Program is a voluntary labeling program uh, for bio-based products. And, you know, products are certified through a third party and then become part of the catalog. And so in the report that just came out, we have over, um, I think last year, there were about 1,400 products that were added to the catalog, so that is now I think around 10,000 products that are carrying the BioPreferred label. Uh, we added I think 500 companies, so now we've got about 2,500 companies uh, participating in the program. Uh, you know, the idea is that people can, just like when you go to the store and you're looking for the USDA organic label, now you can look for the USDA BioPreferred label. Uh, it's a little bit harder than you think to get folks to, to, you know, to really pay attention to it, and we're, you know, we're working to try to get, um, uh, you know, folks like Amazon to to carry the label in their climate smart or climate climate smart friendly uh, categories. So we have things that we are trying to do. It's just we've got to just keep pushing on it. So we're seeing some success there, it's just slow going. And as far as federal contractors go, I wish I had an answer for you on why that has been slow. Um, I don't think I mentioned this, but I am in week seven of this position. And so, uh, believe it or not, there are a few things I'm just not up to, up, uh, up to speed on yet. And the contractor situation and the procurement is something that I, I, I know it's a challenge, and I have talked to my team already because I keep getting this feedback. Do we need to do more education around it? Uh, do we need to you know, have one-on-ones with the procurement officers? What is it that needs to be done to create that, um, that buzz and really uh, about, about the mandate for procurement? Beth, from your perspective, what is the, the biggest barrier facing the build out of the infrastructure? It's always been a, this has always been a pretty capital intensive um, sector, but a lot more federal assistance, we talked about tax credits, a lot more is available than has been in the past. Sure, um, and I guess I'm gonna speak more from a, a big perspective. Uh, IBRL has been open for about five and a half years. And in that time, we've worked with over 100 different companies. So rather than speaking to one particular end product or end market, um, what we see is more or industry trends, I would say. And um, 
I, my facility is at an R1 institution. I'm, I'm part of the University of Illinois. And so as, as part of an R1 institution, our role is really still research and development. We are not a manufacturing partner and we're not geared to be a manufacturing partner. We work with maybe 1,000 to 2,000 liters or kilograms, it doesn't really matter. We'll work with solid or liquids. Um, but that's, that's kind of the scale at which we work. And so that's great for companies that need to prove out technologies or uh, get samples for investors or potential customers um, or even data for grass certification, whatever that might be. But at, at the core, that's still research and development. Um, so when our clients, when the companies that work with IBRL, quote unquote, graduate, um, where do they go next? And this has been the biggest problem that we have seen uh, because the majority of our clients go overseas to do the next stage of their development work. Um, this is a huge missed opportunity for the US economy, uh, but it's also a huge problem for these startups and it's another barrier for these technologies to be commercialized and, and to reach a success um, because now you've got employees who are traveling to Europe for six to eight weeks at a time. They're going back and forth to run trials. Uh, that's creating company churn. Uh, those, those employees burn out. We see that with our clients all the time. Um, we really feel that if the US invested in some of those resources like the EU and some other places in the world have, uh, that those companies would stay and do all of their work from innovation at the lab scale, which we see, you know, the U.S. is, you, you said that the, the U.S. is the hotbed for innovation. Um, and then if, you know, we could, we could develop this whole pipeline, then there would be no reason for these companies to go anywhere else in the world. So from a policy perspective, uh, I mean, historically, it's been extremely difficult to get money for capital intensive infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we kind of saw that through the biofuels era um, and, and there were some real challenges in, in biofuels and now uh, it's, even, it's even harder to get funding for capital intensive projects. And what I would say is that uh, the, the past couple of years we have seen historic investments in, in capital and in infrastructure. Um, and I hope that that money continues to roll out. I hope that uh, it has continued to be invested in physical infrastructure uh, because, you know, James mentioned earlier the, the workforce development side of this, and I'm at a university, so I also teach and I advise students. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to train them for great jobs and I want to help develop the workforce. But if we don't fix this gap, if we don't have the infrastructure, I don't know what industry I'm going to be training them for. Well, on that note, we have, want to get to the, some of the audience questions. And one, the first question we got, Betsy, is for you. And that is what, uh, what is rural development doing to simplify grant and loan uh, programs and requests? I'm sorry, could you say, to do what? What is the USDA rural development doing to simplify grant and loan requests and the grant and loan programs? Well, we are working. So some of the programs that they're talking about, like the Rural Energy for America program, which is uh, for renewable energies, um, those, by the way, can also be used for energy efficiency upgrades. And then I think Kevin mentioned the value-added producer grant. Um, his, th those applications are in need of simplification, to put it mildly. Um, the the value-added producer grant simplification is already underway. Uh, the REAP, as we call it, application is, is being worked on as well. That's the so, Rural Energy for the America The Rural Energy program. for America program. We call it REAP. And um, I, while, I've got, while, I've, while we're talking about that, though, I want to mention again that these programs can be, can, can be used by rural development in multiple ways. So for the value at a producer grant, you, just because you use one program doesn't mean that you can't use another program. And so, for example, we just talked um, last week with Ametis, which is a, pro, a company that is involved in our biorefinery, renewable chemical, and bio-based products manufacturing program, right? The 9003 program, which has loans available for up to $250 million for manufacturing. And so they're using that 
They're also using the Rural Energy for America pro grant and loan program for anaerobic digesters. Uh, you can use that, you can use business and industry guaranteed loans. All of these programs work together uh, to try to address the capital needs that our rural businesses have. And yes, we are trying to make the applications easier. Okay. We have a question about, uh, about measuring carbon intensity. I'd like to step back a little bit from that. How we, we know a lot of corporations, and this has certainly been a big change in the last 10, 20 years, uh, a, a lot of corporations are much more interested now in reducing their uh, carbon footprint, uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. We know the Securities and Exchange Commission has backed off a bit from what it was going to originally propose in terms of disclosure, but we still have California's got uh, regulations that it's implementing on disclosing greenhouse gas emissions, including scope three supply chain emissions. What kind of impact is that going to have on this sector in terms of de potential demand for your for the products? And um, what kind of barrier is the, the questioner is asking about measuring? That's a big question. I know a big unanswered question out there. But first of all, in terms of what's the, how much is this corporate interest in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions potentially going to have for biomanufacturing? Uh, Tom, can we start with you? Maybe James, you and Nakub? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the customers that we work with, particularly the downstream um, consumer-facing brands that have committed to the, to the public, to their customers, to investors that they are going to reduce their emissions, including scope, scope two and three emissions, um, are companies like Lululemon, Zara, Zara, uh, Coty, which makes uh, Gucci and other uh, fragrances, um, Craghoppers, On Shoes. We've made all of these, we've actually made products for each of these companies using waste gases that were captured and uh, converted through biology. They, they don't have options, they really don't. And that demand pull is essential, right? A lot of the, the, the folks that we talk to, many in this room, are really on the supply side, right? We're really talking about what, what could we do to, to provide clean products, low carbon products to supply chains that exist today. What we don't have is a really strong pull, at least in, in the US. I mean, it depends on the regulatory environment. Um, honestly, in, in Europe, there's a, there's a much stronger pull because the, the industrial uh, emissions are so regulated. Uh, but we're not doing that here. So we need to really connect the two. And the method that you do that is through carbon intensity. Um, and, and actually, Neku, um, you didn't get, really get to talk about it much, but in addition to the hurdles that we all have to, to face, just meet, you know, just proving that we meet the spec, um, we don't get to talk a lot about the many other benefits that we bring through bio-based products, right? That they're lower energy use, lower water use, lower um, toxic emissions that come from today's fossil fuel supply chains. And those, those are, in most policies, completely ignored. They're only, you know, sort of from a stovepipe perspective, looking at, oh, just the carbon intensity. Uh, but, the, but carbon intensity and life cycle analysis is the method by which we, we are judged. And so we all need to be working on that uh, and working with, with USDA, with Department of Energy, with e EPA, just within the US government agencies to make sure that the, the data that supports that is robust and believed by the public and by con customers and those companies. Maybe to, to build on what you said, Tom, I mean, it's that, it's that uh, discussion of environmental benefit, right? CI mm -hmm. score is one that, that folks talk about from a biofuels perspective, but when you think about kind of bio-based products more broadly, it's, it's much broader than, than just sort of the, the greenhouse gas conversation. It's looking at soil health. Um, some of these products, you know, you know, can be, can be compostable and, and biodegradable, and so you've got uh, the ability to bring organic matter back into the soil. It's, you know, talking about air quality and, and the greenhouse gas benefit. It's talking about water quality, whether that's, you know, reducing the, the amount of plastic, uh, just we see in streams and oceans, um, or it's, it's sort of the contaminant question there. Um, and, and then kind of the final is municipal waste. I think it's part of y'all's business model, Tom, but, but you know, as you think about some of these products that they're sent to landfills, I mean, they, you know, emitting methane, and so products that are, uh, from a bio-based perspective, can address those concerns as well as, as sort of from a CI score. Mm -hmm. Niku? Yeah. For us, uh, sadly, the construction industry is one of the less uh, regulated or interested in, in this uh, green product. However, we new regulations are starting to ask all this uh, 
construction companies to to use uh, bio-based products that will uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions since uh, that construction industry is almost one-fourth of all the energy consumption in the U.S. So really uh, energy and carbon intensive industries uh, we're just seeing new uh, mandates to use uh, less uh, of the petroleum-based materials. So, mm. okay. We have a question here, uh, and I think this is uh, uh, in, maybe go back to you, Neku. Um, somebody's asking whether the uh, companies doing research and development. And I think this would include seed companies. Are they focusing enough on the quality and uh, the output? puts of the materials uh, downstream as opposed to the qu quantity and yield of the of the seeds are they are they thinking enough you've obviously been doing this in the soybean area for a while is there enough of uh, focus on from the seed development development of traits so products we, that you're trying to make yeah we don't do any research on the seed itself so all of our re, uh, research and development goes on the final products and 100 percent we need to meet the first uh, all the performance uh metrics uh before we can say that we have a product so uh, that's for sure there's all r d in our side goes after uh I mean, our raw material is the oil, so we didn't do anything before that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. James, any thoughts here on what? Yeah, I would, and I think the, the question is sort of looking at innovation broadly in the, in the ag sector, whether it's the seed technology or kind of inputs that growers use or on the manufacturing side. And I think there's been a, a lot done on the, that yield question, right? I mean, we've got the same or fewer acres, I think, um, as, as we used 100 years ago to grow corn today, um, quite a few fewer, I think about at least 10, 10 million fewer, and, and you've got a 600% increase in, in yield. I mean, that biomass question that, that, that sort of Betsy talked about, it's available. Um, so there has been a lot of activity there, but thinking about the manufacturing side and the product side, durability is a guarantee. You have to have a product that's as durable, that provides the same level of, of reliability in the marketplace or more, um, you know, kind of as these products are, and so there needs to be more research and, and development done, I think, in that space, and that's what, what companies are doing. Betsy, we have a question for you. Someone wants to know how woody biomass and low-value timber products fit into uh, USDA's work in this space. We've talked um, a lot about crops. Yeah, well, they, it, it, it fits in in a variety of ways. Uh, we are, you know, for the Rural Energy for America program, um, we, I think in the last two years, have invested $128 million um, in eight loans and another $48 million in 56 grants uh, for biogas and biomass. And it's a, you know, so it's a great way to help support the industry. We work alongside Forest Service and we know that um, it, we are working with them right now on, we have a a whole division of rural development that is working with uh, forestry on biomass or on woody mass to try and figure out how our programs can better support that area. And I think we also, it's important to note that the 9003, the, the bio um, manufacturing, the anaerobic digestion, the companies that can take advantage of that, woody mass plays a big part in that. So we don't have one program that is specific to woody biomass. What we know is that it can benefit from all of our programs and it's kind of our job to make sure that we're communicating that a little bit more effectively than we have in the past. People who are doing, using you know, manure from dairy cows, uh, they know how they use our programs. Woody mass, we're working on it. Hmm. Beth, I'd like to, uh, you talked about the, the challenge of, of getting the infrastructure to where the students can work. What would you? What would your message be? What's the one thing you would like to see in Washington to help spur that infrastructure development, that build out? Sure. Um, I think. I think again, it kind of goes back to investing more in larger multi-use facilities. Um, and that's that's kind of the the takeaway. Um, like I said, I go. Uh, my facility goes up to a certain size. Um, 
but even once our clients, once our, once the companies graduate from us, we want them to be successful. Um, again, I'm at a state institution. I'm not here to pick winners or losers. Our, our feeling is that if we can support more technologies and more companies, there will be more commercial successes. Um, but I'd really like to see some facilities that can do early stage manufacturing uh, for these companies without them having to partner with a multinational immediately. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just down the road from uh, Decatur, Illinois, where uh, ADM and Permian are both located. And a lot of the startup companies are not prepared uh, when, when they leave IBRL, when they are ready to do their first manufacturing run, to partner with an industry, uh, an industry of that scale. Um, for a variety of reasons that we could get into, but but they're just not prepared for that yet. And so in Europe, what they have are, are facilities that are multi-use. Companies can go there and do a larger scale. So if I go to 2,000 liters, the facilities in, uh, in Europe might go to 70,000 liters, and they can actually sell product out of those facilities. And what I would like to see is investment similar to what the EU did, but here in the US for facilities where m many companies Companies can get products on the market and on shelves um, and, and become revenue positive faster without those capital in, uh, investments themselves. Philip, would you mind yes. if I, I jumped in just, just an, an additional note? There, there are some examples that exist today, so this will be a little bit of a commercial, but um, the Biomade program, for example, you know, has, is, is just now unveiling uh, an infrastructure spending plan to, to do exactly what Beth is talking about. Um, so I would just encourage people to go to, to Biomade and check that out. Um, that's from Department of Defense dollars uh, authorized and, and appropriated by Congress. Um, and I'd also point out that there are also folks in the room from the National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnology. And um, they, are, they have been working for the last year and will continue to work uh, towards the end of this year coming up with, with um, priorities for Congress to consider. And I think this, is, this has already been highlighted in their interim report and a really important point. And, and, and Lancetech, we've done, we've done this, like, like you said, uh, you know, we, we can't benefit from that now, but there are so many other startup companies that we work with all the time who are facing that, that real challenge of they just don't have the capital to be able to take, it, take these incredible ideas from the innovation stage through those early R&D, which is often supported by the government, by NSF, by the Department of Defense, by Department of Energy, et cetera, and then take those to what it really means to scale up. And we've done it. We're, we're, we have commercial scale facilities around the world that are doing biotechnology at industrial scale, very impressive stuff. The leap between the R&D and getting deployed is really, really wide. And the U.S., this is something that we have faltered on in this country, and we have to turn it around. Okay. Phil, I might just mention, too, I mean, from a policy perspective with the Farm Bill conversation still alive, you know, there, there are members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that are looking at opportunities here, too, to, to look at existing programs, the Biorinary Assistance Program being one of those, uh, to, to sort of focus on this need that, that Beth and others have talked about. Mm, okay. We're going to have to wrap up here momentarily. Neku, Betsy, I want to give you all the last uh, last word. Where do you think we're going to be here? Uh, what's going to surprise us in five years, uh, five to ten years? When we're because we've been talking, you know, where is this going? What are we going to see? You see a breakthrough in the next five years in terms of this business? And Betsy, I'd like you to wrap up. Yeah, for sure. I think you know, at least in our industry, there's going to be late adopters, but. We see everything pointing into there's going to be a, a big uh, adoption of uh, bio-based uh, technology that are perf uh, performance advantage, uh, price advantage, and also uh, good for the farmers uh, and rural communities. And Betsy, is this going to trickle down to the farmers? Uh, are they going to are they going to see? It's not going to trickle down. It's going to start with the farmers, and that's where the money's going to go, if we have anything to say about it. Uh, they should be making the money off of this. So yes, and the, you know, I think that what we're going to see in five years is the bio-preferred uh, product label everywhere. It's going to be an industry standard. People are going to be looking for it. Uh, we're going to see some of these um, new fertilizers that, you know, that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act funding that are now just being stood up, that are, uh, you know, made through uh, renewable chemicals and, you know, plant-based, those are going to be 
on the market. I think a lot of these investments that have that are being made right now, uh, we're going to be seeing them contribute to the economy in a profound way, and it will be farmer centered. Join me in thanking this panel.